in 2021, we actually sent out over 115 million notifications to people at risk in India and Bangladesh, alerting them of floods coming their way eight hours or more before the floods actually get there. So this is really life-saving. Now, if I look back and I think about w what, what are the ingredients that we can actually take away from this kind of experience, one is that if a problem seems to be too difficult, it doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to solve it. It doesn't mean that we need to throw 20 people to work on that right away. We can actually do that in a staged way and move fast. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. 20 Minute Leaders is a proud supporter of Make-A-Wish Israel and tech to peace and is in proud collaboration with Secret Chord Ventures, J Ventures, Riverside FM, Fusion VC, Birthright Excel, J Impact, Leap, Google for Startups, and Hippo, and in media partnership with C-Tech. Welcome to episode 1000 of 20 Minute Leaders. This is a very special episode for a multitude of reasons. First of all, it's a big milestone, a thousand episodes, and uh, I'm still wrapping uh, my head around what that even means and what I've learned over these thousand uh, conversations with some of the most amazing people that are around and uh, really distilling what leadership is about. And I'm extremely happy and proud that for my 1000th episode, I have one of the most amazing leaders I've ever met, and my own dad, Yossi Matias. And in this longer than usual episode, we'll dive into a little bit who he is and the journey that he's been on in uh, establishing his own leadership style and his own curiosity and the impact that he makes for the world. And it's a huge, huge impact. And so I'm, I'm very, very happy to welcome my dad, Yossi Matias, who is Vice President Engineering and Research at Google, advancing AI to help transform healthcare, conversational AI, and the climate crisis. He is the global lead of Google's Health AI, Google's Crisis Response, and Climate Crises AI initiatives, and pioneered conversational AI technologies. Previously, he was on Google Search's leadership for over a decade and established Google Center in Israel and grew it to over 2,500. He oversaw Google's site in Bangalore, India through its fourfold growth, and oversees Google's expanding research center in Africa. He is a founding lead of Google's AI for Social Good and of Google for Startup Accelerator. He also is on the computer science faculty of Tel Aviv University with over 100 published papers and the inventor of over 60 patents. He was previously a research scientist at Bell Labs, a visiting professor at Stanford, and, of course, an entrepreneur, and we'll talk about that in the episode. Among his recognitions, Yossi is a recipient of the Gettle Prize and the ACM Kanalakis Theory and Practice Award for seminal work on large-scale data analytics. Yossi Matias, welcome to 20 Minute Leaders episode 1000. Thank you for being here. Michael Matias, thanks for having me here. <laughs> so from pleasure, now, great honor. From now on, I'm going to call you dad on the show so that uh, I can reduce my own, the, 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 the feeling of calling you Yossi. Um, and sure. I'm really excited for this episode. I've done, uh, uh, I guess, 999 other episodes. Uh, and, uh, and this is by far the most exciting one for many reasons. Um, definitely one that I, I thought I would be most prepared for, um, but it turns out that coming in here, I almost feel like I am furthest away because I know there's so much for me to, to unpack here. And, uh, and I'm really excited. It's going to be a really interesting journey for the two of us having this conversation, which... Um, you know, I'm excited for everybody also to to hear and, and get to know you through some of our conversations. So thank you for, for agreeing to do this. Right. It's a great pleasure and it's an honor. And it's pretty amazing that it's a, it's been now 999 episodes. Wow. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. It. Wow. It's, pre it's pretty wild. There's a lot of things that, that we could talk about. You know, the world is changing, you know, First, software was eating the world, and now data is ruling the world. The world as we know it through our priorities is shifting. 
you know, and, and entrepreneurs and scientists like yourself are shifting mindsets as to what we should be prioritizing on. And, and we'll talk about that as well. But what I really want to talk about is your journey in the context of the incredible things you've done and the way that you're doing them today and the journey that you're allowing other people as well to go through. And we'll, we'll get to that, but, but we have to start somewhere. And I want to take you all the way back to your childhood. We're going to start there because um, you're a very special thinker and I can testify for that myself. And I want hopefully to learn myself and for others to hear a little bit about what brought on this special thinking. And you, I want to start with um, your, your runs. You were an athlete growing up. What, what is that part of your life? Well, it was actually... I was actually a late athlete because I only started in high school. So I had a very short career, to be honest. I mean, I was pretty good in, you know, running, jumping and all that stuff. But it's only in the middle of high school that I actually went and made it a very serious endeavor for two years, which ended up uh, when I was drafted. So for two years, I was a serious athlete. But that athlete wasn't just in the track and in the competition. I recall um, that running was also a pretty significant part of your own problem-solving mindset, um, especially in mathematics. Yes. Yeah, so one thing I discovered when I used to, I used to run every morning, I think it was about 10K. This was kind of in my very short period of being an athlete. Uh, this was my morning routine. Now, at the same time, actually, the thing that I liked most was um, probably the, one of the very few things I actually liked at school at the time was uh, math. And I, ha I was privileged to have an amazing math teacher. His name is Ori. Um, he's a very special teacher for many in Israel, a legendary one. And he used to bring some uh, math Olympiad questions to class and throw at us but also try to solve him himself. And occasionally he used to, you know, call me in the afternoon when he was walking his dog about, hey, um, I used to go to the balcony and he used to throw some ideas and we used to kind of exchange ideas. So what I discovered is that actually the time that I got the best ideas to tackle those uh, pretty tough problems, typically, that they give in these uh, math Olympiads was when I used to run. And once in a while, I used to kind of suddenly something hit me and I used to perhaps stop for a moment and if needed to draw something in the in the sand or in the mat. Just, and, and in many cases, I, I, I found out that actually when running, that's actually where the mind was actually a little more relaxed to think more freely, not in a, in a kind of in wonder a little bit. And that's where some time actually some of the best ideas came, came about. And uh, years later, I actually discovered that the same also for when I had uh, long drives or, or just, just a, a long period of time. People call it sometimes now focus time. <laughs> that yeah. it's, it's time that actually somehow you reflect and you're not necessarily making the effort to solve a problem, but then suddenly it hits you. Hey, this actually comes together. So actually, this was a nice kind of combination. Of course, this was only when doing these long runs, when doing um, kind of more intensive exercise in the field. That's that's not where great ideas come actually to mind. Was was mathematics always, you know, a, a core piece of your interests, you know, or did that start before high school? Well, it was always something I liked to do, but there were times that actually I was more into writing and drawing. So in fact, if you'd ask me in elementary school what I'm going to be, probably I would say a writer. Uh, and um, I, I was probably blessed to growing up at times there were no screens, so, and I loved reading, so, and I read a lot. I, sometimes I read two books a day. So what, what kind of books did you like? All sorts of books, you know, romance, uh, you know, literature, classic literature, stories about, uh, you know, fiction, a lot of, uh, just r a lot of stuff. And then later on, I actually started also reading nonfiction and, and later on, 
I started actually getting more interested in philosophy books. So this was at some point philosophy was my main interest. In fact, well, I remember you telling me you read, you read some philosophy books at nine. And so when you say later on, <laughs> well, I was thinking philosophy, I started reading it a little later, but I was a little, I was concerned with the mid questions that are <laughs> more like, um, you know, existence, what people now call the metrics and all that stuff. Um, simulations and all that, these kind of matters, they were bothering me for a little while until they were not. So um, until I figure out actually I shouldn't bother with them because um, we have a lot, enough to worry about in our kind of, in whatever we call existence. So, uh, and a lot of exciting stuff happening around us anyway. You draft uh, to just like, you know, everybody in Israel and um and then um, I recall that this period of time was was also very monumental. You meet uh, my mom, obviously, and um, and so already that's a, a very special, the most special moment probably in uh, in in the service. Um, well, it's the most important point in my life. So yeah, so it's it's a very important one. Yeah. Some parents say the day that their kids are born is the most important day of their life, but okay. Um, but. <laughs> That was also a time. That's, where, that's a precondition. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> um, music is a huge part of your life as well. A very is, active yeah. part of your life. And I recall that also really took a leap during your service, which was flying planes. So it's not the most trivial service. Yeah. So music is an important part of my life. Interestingly enough, as a kid, I did not appreciate it as much. So uh, I have to thank my, my father, uh, who kind of insisted that I take those piano lessons, um, albeit my resistance. And, um, and it was only again late in high school that I started appreciating and uh, discovering the beauty of classical music, jazz, and actually starting practicing seriously only when I was actually during my service. So um, at some point I actually bought this used piano, brought it to my room, which was pretty unusual. And for a few hours. months, yeah. And for a few months, I actually used any available hour to actually practice. So I did a lot of progress in those few months before I became too busy to do that. And ever since I'm kind of still practicing once in a while. So it's uh, making, start trying to make some progress ever since. And, and why jazz? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I love classical music uh, as well, but jazz is, what I discovered about jazz is that it has this combination of depth, complexity. Uh, however, it has this both discipline as well as uh, freedom. So improvisation is something that has a uh, in fact, is rooted in very deep, very deep structure, very deep kind of, uh, uh, you know, relationships within the music and rooted in a lot of um, legacy of ideas and techniques and, uh, and a lot of knowledge. And at the same time, it's totally up to you to actually follow your, whatever you're, you'd like to do. And it has this other aspect of playing together. And that togetherness has this beautiful aspect of communicating, um, working as a team, if you will. I mean, people like to draw this analogy and rightfully so between playing music and teamwork and organizations and all that stuff. And I think there are many indeed, uh, one can just think about everything that happens at, at work and teamwork. Uh, from music, but but that's not the reason why I actually liked it in the first place. It's just because of its beauty and the ability to actually, um, it has this something that touches both the mind and the heart in the figurative way. And, um, and it's something that actually, as you learn to appreciate the structure, the more you the more you know about it, the more you can actually appreciate it, which, which I think is, is pretty magical. What was the leap that you that that you made into the you know the research world? Because as I recall, even when you, I mean, the, throughout the years, obviously, you became a very prominent researcher. But initially, when you even were starting academia, you weren't 
necessarily even going that route, right? So, yeah, it's an interesting question. First, uh, probably the first thing I actually enrolled to at the university is philosophy. Uh, I did it when I was still serving in the Israeli Air Force. So uh, I took a few classes and um, I, I didn't I didn't like the way it was taught. So I actually decided that it's I'm not going to uh, prefer just to read it on my own. Um, I had a, out of high school and again, a lot of it thanks to amazing teachers I had. Um, I appreciated mostly math and physics. And initially I planned to study math and physics. Uh, it it was only thanks to my brother-in-law who suggested, hey, why don't you check computer science, that I decided to also add computer science on top of that. So I had a pretty heavy schedule for the first year. And, and, and that, tell me a little bit about that interaction, um, you know, that, that type of, because that during that time, it was it, it definitely wasn't as popular as today, but what was sort of the sentiment around computer science when you were studying it or when you were starting it out? Well, it was relatively early, you know, this was around the time the typical computer science was part of the math school in most universities. So it was still the kind of the first generation of computer science. Um, but the basics were already there, right? So first it's kind of the basic stuff, uh, different languages. At the time it was Pascal, that was the modern language, which is, of course, by now long forgotten uh, in terms of uh, teaching. Uh, but that's not the material. The, 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 main, the main thing is that when, when encountering these questions of, uh, of algorithms and problem solving and the magical capability of taking a problem and finding the right approach and the opportunity to create, because I think that computer science is, one of the, is, is an amazingly creative discipline, because all the time you... Well, in a way, mathematics, it's, it's similar to mathematics in this sense, but it opens up all these new dimensions. So one can think about computer science as uh, something that has uh, connections to mathematics, to engineering, um, and uh, many similarities also to other disciplines that we have. Now, of course, it touches any, anything in life that you can imagine. But what got me, I guess, is the this notion that uh, there are these i love i love solving problems so this was this was one thing i did used to do as a kid which was taking these uh, newspaper problem riddles and uh, liking to tackle them and try to solve them uh, as much as i was kind of hooked on these uh, math olympiad kind of questions so this was actually an opportunity to solve problems in a way that actually solves something real and i think this combination of hey, you can actually take this intellectual challenge, have the satisfaction of having a solution for that. And the solution is actually something that does something useful, is something which I think is, is, is pretty profound. I think, and, and actually this is something I enjoy up to today. This is kind of the combination of uh, creating something which is uh, non-trivial. It requires some thinking and some creativity, some perhaps sometimes solving something that some, some that other people could never do. But once you do that, you actually have something that is useful, is solving a real problem. And, uh, and this is pretty powerful. So and I, I, once I discovered that, actually, I, I was very passionate about physics. So, but I decided to nevertheless move my focus to computer science. Interestingly enough, what I started in physics, even, um, uh, on the, even on the first year that I did, was actually quite influential later on in my research, but that's a separate story. What, what is research in, in your eyes? You've, you've written um, many papers and uh, some of them have become to, to be pretty foundational concepts. I had the, uh, the honor of, um, of being your plus one for, uh, the ACM awards, uh, this, uh, last year in, uh, in San Francisco, a pretty wild experience, uh, still in university myself and going and, uh, you know, in university, I would be lucky if I had the opportunity to, for, for a minute with one of my professors in the computer science space. And I walk with you into the, the ACM hall and I see the entire faculty just lined up waiting pretty much, pretty much to talk to you 
among the, some of the other winners uh, or, or recipients. Uh, and even that award, I believe, was up for something that, you, that you've done many years ago, right? Yes, this was kind of, um, it was called the Kanalakis uh, Theory and Practice Award, actually for work that, a theoretical work that over time proved to be, to have a, a significant impact in practice. And so that, so, you know, I'm sure that a lot of people, you know, can, can, you know, fathom and understand, you know, this creation of taking something and leveraging problem solving and creativity to create something tangible. But when you do research, I'm, I, I, I'm really curious as to what that experience is like. Uh, for example, when you were a researcher in Bell Labs and you're sitting and you're, and you're not really sure what's going to happen. What, what does that research process looks like from your, from your mindset and how did you experience that? So research is the kind of, um, okay, there are various types of research, of course. There are some research where somebody is trying to research a very, well, actually the, the common thing for research uh, activity, I guess, uh, is always at, at the end of the day is to select the problem that you try to solve and then looking for new ways for, for a solution, essentially, namely now by definition, to be, it, it's about solving something that is not already being solved. Otherwise, it wouldn't be research. Now, the depth and the type of research varies. There are sometimes some problems that are open, um, you know, for many years with many people trying to solve them. And, uh, and, and these are kind of, uh, and, and, and some quite often the, the way in which research is done in the research community is that, um, there are some some aspirational big research problems. I mean, in computer science, the famous one is, for example, P versus NP. Okay. Um, but then, in order to get there, researchers, the research community, people are defining steps towards that. So they're trying to advance the state of the art of what we know about many things. Uh, or in computational pro in algorithms, sometimes it can be let's solve a, an important problem such as a matrix multiplication, and let's find a better algorithm to doing so. And just recently, for example, there was um, a few works uh, of showing how to do matrix multiplication even better than known before, which was kind of got a lot of attention, rightfully so. But anyway, it is an example for a problem that uh, if you apply the usual text, the, the basic algorithm, it would take, you know, certain complexity, but then uh, there are some better approaches to do that. So now, of course, when you think about day about research, then the, the, the breadth of it is, is so broad because essentially every, every, every startup, every project, every place you need, there's room for research because you, in, you encounter all these problems that you say, hey, wait a minute. For some of them, I can actually use node solutions, but there's an opportunity here to do something better. Let's see if we can actually find a way to do that even better. Now, again, as I mentioned, some of the research is really kind of um, uh, relatively simple or applied research, which is let's apply whatever we already know and let's try to push the solution to a better one. Sometimes it's really to go very deep and trying to solve something that is even surprising that nobody actually even believed they could do that. And, and there are quite a few, uh, fortunately, there are quite a few uh, examples where things that are believed to be very difficult eventually are solvable. And uh, sometimes even the solution is, is simpler than people anticipated, which, and that actually creates all these amazing progress that we see in technology. Can you, can you paint me the picture of what you as a researcher was like? What that experience was like for you personally, perhaps at, at Bell Labs or, in, or, or at the Weizmann Institute or, or any of the locations where you, or, or Google, where you continue doing pretty intense research? Sure. So, so one thing about the research, uh, one important aspect, of course, is, the ask, is to ask the right questions, is to select what do you want to work on and then what is the question that you want to ask. In fact, when you think about research at the university academic setting, uh, an important role of the academic advisor, the professor, is to help with asking the question and guide the sequence of questions. And asking the right question is so fundamental and so important. Uh, because you want to ask questions that are wo both, both the matter, they're will going to give you progress that eventually will get you somewhere, but also 
that are solvable in a way that you can actually hope to get something out there. You don't want to be too easy because then the progress is going to be not as meaningful. On the other hand, if they're too hard, then perhaps it's going to be a frustrating experience and not useful uh, to anybody involved. So that's a tricky part is how to make the right selection and how to do that. Now, from a personal point of view, um, when I did, it actually, it varies over the years. So one thing that uh, my interests are actually pretty broad and uh, and all my style of study is all that is, is was always in research was always in a way kind of a combination of there was always something that I was extremely interested in focusing in that particular moment. And then there were a few others that were kind of just kind of um, to to have additional kind of uh, to go after some interest. Now, one of the important aspects was always to keep some discipline so that not spreading too thin. So this, this trade-off between focus and diversity, which is another trade-off that we all need to worry about in whatever we do, also when we're leading teams and we develop products, when we build companies, uh, was always there actually also for me. So now when I did my master, for example, at the Whiteman Institute uh, with Adi Shamir, Professor Adi Shamir, it's, um, uh, I, I actually looked into a problem that was touched on many disciplines. So it, in a way, this was an amazing opportunity to touch on fractal physics and digital signal processing and uh, cryptography and security and to do all that for a problem that was motivated by actually just encryption of analog video signals. So I loved actually bringing all this together and I actually was an opportunity also to go back to uh, you know, my physics roots, as well as to learn a lot of things that actually were very helpful later in my, my kind of um, future research. For my PhD, I actually decided to, to totally switch to a different direction. I decided to actually want to do something in theoretical computer science, but I wanted to look into a problem that I thought is going to be important, which is to do parallel algorithms, how to do, how to run how to design algorithms for a future case of, um, you know, where we are going to have many, many computers that we can run in parallel. And my thesis was essentially about how to, uh, it was titled Highly Parallel Randomized Algorithmics and essentially showing that you can have many fundamental problems where if you have many, many processors, say you have a problem of size million, and you have a million processors, you can practically solve many of these problems in constant time under certain assumptions. And of course, it requires required many kind of new and uh, interesting uh, algorithmic techniques. I remember still that somebody came to me and said, these, all, these are very uh, you know, elegant algorithms, but uh, why would you need to solve anything in constant time? And when on earth will you ever have so many processors? So uh, anyway... So this was a, a nice, uh, uh, so this was my, my kind of PhD I type research. I hope this person is listening to this now. <laughs> um, but after my PhD, actually my research tastes again shifted. And at some point I was no longer interested to solve theoretical problems per se. I was actually looking to see how can I actually find a way to apply what I learned on parallel algorithms and find ways to actually apply to real parallel computers, yeah, 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 yeah. which, and that's actually where I started looking for some places where we actually use parallel computers in the field. Now, interestingly enough, this led me into working with um, identifying that the, uh, the largest parallel computer, commercial parallel computer at the time that was in use in the world was actually uh, not too far from where I was in, a researcher at Bell Labs at the time. And th this was a computer a data warehouse by uh, Teradata, which was actually part of at t the parent company of uh, Bell Labs at the time. So I actually reached out to that group and I found out that, uh, yeah, I could actually apply some of my understanding of parallel computation to wow. actually solve real problems for that they actually struggled with for many months. Huh. and give them solutions that would actually work in practice. So this was actually this nice example where having the, the understanding, the algorithmic understanding of what's going on was very helpful to solve a problem that engineering alone was not, was insufficient. Now, 
one of the magical things about research and I guess technology development is the serendipity of how to you uncover new opportunities. So actually by solving the problem for parallel computation, that's where I actually learned that they have even a bigger problem than that, which was how to handle with the fact that the amount of data that accumulated every day in the data warehouse was so big that their basic computation could not handle that. Actually, that's where I was exposed to what people are now called the big data problem early on. And helping them solve that problem actually led me also to also do theoretical research that eventually is the one that led to that ACM award that you were mentioning earlier. So we have all these circles that are connected yeah. in ways that sometimes are difficult to predict. Yeah, but, but one, one, you know, if you want to thread a needle and you want to, you do see the curiosity in a very, you know, broad field, starting from, from philosophy and mathematics and problem solving and reading fiction and nonfiction uh, to music and classical and jazz and, and obviously uh, flying planes in military uh, and then uh, transitioning to academia and their theoretical, applicative, theoretical, applicative. And, and then you meet entrepreneurship as the as CEO of a company during the, you know, the, the, the right on the change of the millennia. And that's a, so going from now research to being a CEO, being an entrepreneur, is that fair? Yeah. So entrepreneurship was also another kind of angle and dimension that I was quite, um, it was interesting. So actually when I, even in my masters after, after developing some technology, I then looked to see, okay, so this was actually pretty novel and, um, and actually very useful. In fact, uh, we showed that we could encrypt analog video signal in a way that actually even improves the quality of that, which is totally counterintuitive. So I actually made a tour and looked to, uh, you know, visited a few places that were looking into various TV standards to see whether this is something that could be useful. <laughs> And, um, but going to the more basic, so as much as I was interested in research, one thing that I was always looking for is to how to solve real problems. So one thing, for example, that, um, uh, be, even before starting my master, I was actually on the fence, whether I'm going to do my master's versus taking a, a, a job at, at a company, at a high tech company, uh, to be an algorithm designer. So I could actually contribute to product development. And, and eventually decided that actually, uh, I'd, I, I should actually continue my, to my master. Similarly, I had the same deliberation after between, bef between, uh, before starting my PhD, actually, I was genuinely deliberating whether I'm going to actually go join a startup at the time, um, or go to my PhD. And it was a real kind of deliberation. So this, and, and similarly, when I was in Bell Labs, it was actually this combination on the one hand, looking into the fundamental research. And I was blessed to be in Bell Labs in the mathematical research center, the same place that Hemming was there. And, you know, the, um, at the time the center head was, uh, my Gary and, uh, one of the department heads was David Johnson. So uh, uh, every computer science student should know the famous book of the Gary and Johnson on NP completeness. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier NP. So I, I really was blessed to be in a place that had on the one hand, the longer term research in Bell Labs. And, and by the way, Peter Shore, uh, was two doors from my office when he designed his, um, quantum factoring. So I still remember the first seminar where he, he was presenting at the same time, the desire to go and, um, and, 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 and solve a real problem for the biggest data warehouse in the world. And also while in Bell Labs, um, at some point I was exposed, internet kind of started becoming a thing. And, uh, I, at some point I, I was kind of heard a problem, you know, I looked into pr uh, technology for privacy preserving for the internet. So that was again, another side project that led actually into forming a venture within um, Lucent, then uh, Bell Labs was part of uh, Lucent uh, at the time. So this was another example of actually taking um, um, 
you know, dancing between research and entrepreneurship. Now, fast forward, at some point, we start seeing this convergence. We start seeing that, you know, entrepreneurship and research are becoming closer together. And in fact, today, that's in a way, I do both. But but going back to uh, to the Zapper chapter, this was indeed, um, uh, at that time, I was already a faculty member at Tel Aviv University. And, um, and this was a, a company that we looked into what can we do better for search? And um, we set up, um, and we had this observation that by using... By the way, just with the, what year is this? Well, this was 2000. Uh, well, the year 1999. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so we looked into, well, can we do something? Um, we had some ideas about how to use the context of uh, what people are doing as, uh, as a way to improve search and uh, and develop this technology that was, in a way, also uh, pioneered a few things. One is the use of context for search, and another one is actually to use um, some techniques that are pretty popular now, of course, of uh, of embedding, and in order to actually use the contextual information so as to get a better scoring, if you will, of what we're looking for, and thereby improve the search results on top of whatever search engine which was there. And what was that ent entrepreneurial journey like for you? And it was an amazing learning experience because um, it was on a very, uh, so I started the journey interested mostly from the technology point of view. And I was encouraged to actually take uh, take kind of the lead as a CEO. So I found myself learning. Now today, of course, I mean, you're teaching kids how to do that as teenagers. Um, at the time, I actually had the learning from zero to building a team of 100 people in no time in a global way and actually launch a product in about a year and do that in a very p fast pace. So yeah, this 100 was, people in a year. It was about 100 people with a pro product that was pretty elaborated and uh, launching it. And uh, it was a, a pretty interesting year. Yes, a year and a half, perhaps. Unbelievable. How do you go from zero? You know, people talk about you know, zero, literally people talk about zero to one and then one to 100, and you just went from zero to 100. And then they say it in different contexts, but th that's what you did. How, so I'm even putting aside the technicalities of how do you even build a team and a product in a year, how do you as, a, as an entrepreneur, manager, CEO, leader, father already at the time, I was already four years old, I guess, at that point you already have three kids uh, in a relocated, you know, and traveling from what I uh, what I remember and hearing quite intensively. How do you do that? Uh, with a lot of adrenaline. And wh what does that mean? And a lot of passion. Uh, I think this was an exciting journey because we knew exactly what we want to build. We had an amazing, we're fortunate to take, uh, you know, to, to hire some of the most brilliant engineers and scientists uh, on, on, on something that was extremely um, exciting. And, uh, and, and, you know, going on a very aggressive kind of uh, milestones and doing this extremely hard effort. Now, I was actually traveling since I built the team in New York, I was actually traveling every second week. So yeah. Uh, this was um, and and coach only. So this was this was actually interesting. So, so just yeah. so we, so what, what was that schedule like? Because we were in, in Tel Aviv at that point, right? So how how did that work? Well, it was every second week more or less to take the Sunday night flight, start the week uh, Monday morning after a run in the Central Park, showing up in the office at seven o'clock or six o'clock in the morning. Um, working more or less around the clock until Thursday evening and landing back in Tel Aviv Friday. So this was the, this was the schedule for a few months. 
for pretty, a good months. Pretty um, incredible. I, w- I want to fast forward a little bit. Um, I'm going to fast forward a lot because there's a lot in between. Um, and uh, and you're, you're leading um, massive teams, hundreds of people, now thousands, uh, within Google. And, um, and so I'm really curious to hear a little bit about your, you know, your leadership philosophy and a little bit about what you perceive to be your role in the journey of others as they grow and as they research and as they create. I've had the pleasure of meeting um, quite a few people that worked with you. Just a few months ago, I was sitting in a bus um, in Dubai next to somebody who worked with you in Zapper. And I know a lot of people that worked with you 17 years ago at Google, and they still work with you today. And so I know that there's a lot there, and I want to capture a little bit of your thinking process around what this role means to you. Uh, not as a as, as a researcher because you still write papers and do research, but but as a leader in their journey. Yeah. So you know, there's this um, fact or cliche which is all about the people, and and it's really all about the people and the team and the culture. And uh, one thing you learn as you kind of uh, start uh, growing up professionally is that. Uh, no matter how smart you are, how creative you are, how much energy you have and how much, uh, you know, effective you are, you're going to do much more when you work with teams and when you can actually have uh, others actually work with you. And, um, and then one thing you adopt is actually to, uh, to make is now, of course, I, I'm blessed to to work, obviously, at Google with some of the brightest people and um, and also people that are fun to work with. Now, the basic thing is to to enable, to let people to try and get the best that we can from our teams. And the way to do that is to support them as needed. And as needed is really something that changes all the time. Sometimes, and um, it's to, it's to be involved in the right way. Now, I like to be involved in the details, so I need to be disciplined sometimes not to get into the details where I don't need to, um, both in consideration of my own time, but also in consideration of uh, to to have the teams work in the right way. So, um, so how to support people, you know, both on the selection of projects, on the right cadence of reviews, on the personal development of people. On providing the right guidance, um, you know, taking my experience, some my observations, sometimes uh, giving the right kind of support, and uh, making sure that we can actually. I mean, when when you get one of the things that I'm extremely proud of is to see the development of many people you mentioned. That uh, you know, some of them started as junior engineers and are now senior directors, VPs. Um, and, or, or entrepreneurs on their own right, and to see their development over the years. And their development is also, some of it is also not only to help them develop as en- better engineers and better scientists, uh, but some of it is actually to help them develop as managers and as leaders. And they have to go through the same process as well. So, uh, so in a way, when, when doing that, that's actually where you get all this big impact. Now, it's about how to encourage people in their development, but similarly in their day-to-day projects, how to, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I once gave a talk about leadership as a balancing act. And all the time you need to do this balancing act between all these considerations in every choice that you do about uh, focus versus diversity. I mentioned earlier, focus and diversity, about um, being providing uh, being more directive versus uh, you know just showing the way and uh, and and let people find the way themselves uh, versus uh, taking decision quickly versus letting them evolve in the right pace so there's no right answer here there's the right question 
And does right judgment call to do it in the right way? And different times call for different types of actions and different circumstances. For example, what you're doing in a young startup, like you had yourself, is totally different when you do when you are in more mature stage, is different when you do have bigger teams. So that's, of course, uh, part of, of, of what we do here. You mentioned um, being an enabler as a, as a key part of, of your role and, and journeys. But I, I, I'm not sure my perspective that's enough. Uh, you know, you led, you know, you, it sounds to me, have a very significant role in people's journeys and the way that they make decisions and the confidence that they may perceive in, in, a, in a large organization, right? This is not, they're not just, you know, make, doing, they're, they're working in a, in a world of possibilities that you are creating for them. And I, I recall quite a few instances in which the way that, you've, that, that you represented entrepreneurial thinking has actually led to some pretty right. monumental um, projects that even made some pretty significant impact on, on people's lives. Yeah, so the notion of entrepreneur, you touched earlier on the question of entrepreneurship and, uh, and I'm tied also to innovation. Okay. And, uh, you know, entrepreneurial, to being entrepreneurial is something that I think is unrelated to where you are, where if you're in a small company, big company. Um, it's really the notion of, and of course, you wrote a book about entrepreneurial, right? Uh, for, for teenagers. So, uh, yeah, so, so, so again, one of the choices that we need to do all the time is to make a call of how to select the right problems and whether, and to take some, the right level of judgment of whether or not we want to invest in them. And, and, and also to have the right level of confidence of whether we want to do something, but also do the right adjustments. So I think it's, um, you cannot overanalyze it but you cannot take that as a whole pass to not do the right level of diligence. So um, let me give an example. One of, the, one of the projects I'm really proud of is our uh, efforts around flood forecasting, where we're actually, um, so just a little background, uh, one of my roles, I'm uh, leading crisis response efforts within Google, which essentially means that it's, uh, people are, coming to Google to look for information during crisis, natural disasters, and more. So we develop technologies and products and making it part of search and maps that people can find help, actionable, helpful information about what's going on during those crises. And a few years back, uh, I found out that actually one of the most significant natural disasters, namely floods, uh, we just don't have the right information to present to people. Because floods, which are uh, assumed to, uh, expected to uh, estimated to to uh, to have thousands of casualties per year, the really helpful information would be for people to know before it actually hit them. So a few years back, um, it was on my list as a problem that we need to take a look at, but it seemed to be a very difficult problem and not clear whether we can actually do anything about it. So I actually asked an engineer to start looking into that part-time um, to see if we can do anything about it. Uh, as namely, how to, can, can we use machine learning and cloud technology for doing that? And a few months later, Sela, who you know, and uh, he came and showed, oh, we showed enough progress on the problem. So I asked him, what do you need in order to run a pilot? And said, well, um, I need to engineer. So, okay, within a few months, we had the first pilot. Fast forward, we now have cloud forecasting as something that is already launched in um India, Bangladesh, and uh, 18 more countries. Wow. Uh, it covers hundreds of millions of people globally. Uh, the team advanced the state of the art of the science for hydrology, uh, publishing a dozen papers, including two of the most downloaded papers in the leading journal of hydrology. Yes. And we have a platform working in collaboration with academia and governments, etc. And we actually have a system. And last year, in 2021, we actually sent out over 115 million notifications to people at risk in India and Bangladesh, alerting them of floods coming their way eight hours or more before the floods actually get there. So this is really life-saving. Now, if I look back 
and I think about w- what what are the ingredients that we can actually take away from this kind of experience. One is that if a problem seems to be too difficult, it doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to solve it. It doesn't mean that we need to throw 20 people to work on that right away. We can actually do that in a staged way and move fast. Um, a second one is that, uh, you know, if, it, if it's going to have a high enough impact, it's worth trying. I mean, that, that's actually the reason for that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and of, of course, there's the power of actually working in collaboration with many. So this is kind of an example for, uh, if you will, sort of taking, taking this kind of entrepreneurial approach for something that looked uh, difficult. Um, and, and of course, I can go on and on on many other such examples. Anything well, let's, me- then, uh, let's dive into what you really um, spend a lot of time on today. You're, you're spending a lot of time on, on health. You're spending a lot of time on climate. You're spending a lot of time on the intersection of artificial intelligence, communication, and and uh, climate crisis response and and health. Let's I, I let's talk a little bit about how today's technology and not just technology, but you know, sort of where we're at in terms of how technology and specifically AI is positioned to augment or change a lot of the ways in which we we live and perceive our life. Yeah, so first, artificial intelligence or AI is uh, it's transformative, and we are actually in the beginning. Um, not not so much just the beginning, because we made some progress of our for revolution. It, it's transformative, obviously. So AI is obviously going to transform and uh, impact every aspect of life, uh, and we we see that actually. The interestingly enough, uh, you know. <clears throat> You asked me earlier about the early days. My my kind of um, final project in my first degree was a machine learning program <laughs> that plays a game, Othello. And um, and even then, using some techniques that actually go back to Samuel's uh, work from the 50s, which was a state of the art still when I was doing my studies. So it wasn't, wasn't much progress. In just a few days and nights, I could actually write a program that actually could beat me probably wouldn't be the, 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 the best player of, of that game. And we've seen that milestone in 98 where computers actually beat for the first time, uh, you know, the world chess player, uh, Kasparov. Uh, but the real revolution actually started out a decade ago, of course, with deep learning. And what we've seen then is nothing short of um, astonishing. So machine learning or AI, uh, which essentially is, is kind of encapsulating machine learning and other, machine learning is the biggest, uh, of course, the most significant technique within that. It went from a situation that we aspired to try and solve a problem which are matching how we as humans are doing to areas where it's actually doing a better job than we do. And, and uh, it, from a technology point of view, um, which essentially is means that we can harness this technology to solve real problems at scale, which is pretty profound. So I give the example of flood forecasting. And, and again, this seems to be a too difficult problem. There are so many parameters. How on earth, um, literally, can we predict where water is going to go? Well, it turns out that actually if you take enough historical data and enough machine simulations, uh, and use that in combination with hydrologic physical models, you can actually come up with models that are predictors of actually it's going to behave and use that in a way that is useful. Uh, similarly, we see that kind of transformation in every other aspect. Now, the nature of technology is that uh, there's this old saying that um, it, progress is slower in the short term than you anticipate, but it's faster than you in the long term than you do, than you anticipate. This was a kind of paraphrasing on this kind of, um, uh, wow. the idea is that you think it's actually, you know, self-driving cars, another example, we're saying, well, it's going to take longer than we expect every year. But in the, but in the grand scheme, scheme of things, yeah. I mean, just 10 years ago, everybody Short said, this is, yeah. everybody said this is not going to happen. It's yep. a science fiction and now it's only a question of when, how many, where, where is it actually going to go to? Similarly, conversations. 
you know, we had this project duplex, which was started out as, let's see if we can actually try to get things done over the phone in real life so that we don't need to do all the errands on our own. And again, starting it, it was kind of a moonshot. But then not only did it actually get to the stage that we could actually use it to make restaurant reservations and find opening hours, but during COVID, uh, we could actually use that in order to make phone calls to millions of businesses to ask their opening hours and, and whether or not they have masks and curbside and whatnot, and put the business information on the web and have billions of views that actually got the right information just because we could use AI to do the kind of scale that there's no way we could do actually with, with people doing these calls. You know, I remember I was in uh, California during that time when, when, when COVID just said, I remember one day I was going to go uh, pick up some food and then or make a reservation to, to pick up some food. And uh, all of a sudden I see a uh, curbside pickup all over Google Maps locations. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, these people are, you know, I can't believe that all these business owners went to Google Maps and, and updated their all of their operations, this is crazy. Everybody has this information. How did that happen so quickly? And only, I guess, a year and a half later, I heard you say that this was actually, a, a, you know, Duplex played a, a big part in it. And that was, that was a, a, a pretty, you know, pretty monumental thing to think about when you really think about the situation in which millions of businesses are changing pretty much overnight. And you have hundreds of millions of people that are relying on these businesses for their day to day. And, uh, you know, we're digitized and all of that, but, but this human computer interaction, this was a really meaningful part. It's uh, it's pretty astonishing. So, so this is an example where you use AI in order to help with human interaction. And, and by the way, when talking about how to use it for the phone, there are all these other use cases, for example, using duplex technology. So that if you need, if you encounter this, um, uh, if you need to wait for an agent, you can let the phone wait for you and have Duplex do the, comp the, yeah. the communication with the agent. By the until, so you pick up the phone, but there are other approaches in which, for example, the fact that we can actually use AI in order to help you with the communication, so that to help you take on calls that you are, you, you're not sure who's calling and you don't want to talk to telemarketing something called call screen, which is actually an idea of, of mom, as you know. Right. So um, uh, one of the most popular features of the phone. Uh, but and, and, and in addition, of course, to the fact that you can actually now use AI to make conversations multimodal. So today we can actually, deaf people can actually have real phone conversations because they can actually read on the phone what is being said. And again, this is an example for a project that came from uh, innovation of one engineer came to talk to me saying, hey, I have an idea of how to help people using some of these technologies that we already uh, developed with additional innovation. And uh, this is the work of Sapir that did an amazing job on this, uh, what we call um, uh, live captions for calls. And I remember you, you mentioned a few years back, uh, you know, one, one of your standards and and i don't believe you have too many as, as a leader but you but you do have one which is that uh, if anybody ever comes to you with a demo yeah. that they want to show you your 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 door is open and that's what and and you're stopping to see that demo and sort of as a way to encourage actually doing and not just thinking of ideas but actually going and implementing and implementing them and i know quite, quite a few of of the projects that became very very meaningful came out of that yeah, my, so, my statement to the team is that if you have a demo to show me, I'm going to step out of any meeting, if I can, uh, to, <laughs> to, to see that. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I really, I, I think that innovation can come in various shapes and forms, and, uh, and, and, and that's a great idea. But going back to your question about these areas, so conversational experience is obviously one big area that is, we see now, of course, huge transformation. Uh, especially with large language models, which probably uh -huh. deserves its own kind of um, uh, episode. And I know you're looking into that quite a bit yourself. Um, 
But let me touch uh, back on, uh, you, you asked earlier about these uh, two areas that I'm really spending a lot of time on. One is about health and one is about the climate crisis. And both are, uh, I think, um, have direct impact on, on people's life. And uh, obviously, and uh, in the future of the world. And in both, we can actually have AI um, play an important role to actually have, help address many of the problems. And um, if I think about, let me start actually with the climate crisis. Um, and, and, you know, when I mentioned floods earlier, and floods is uh, one, one thing we've seen in the last couple of years is actually increase in the frequency and intensity of floods, because this is the, actually the result of the climate, uh, climate change. Uh, similarly, we see more wildfires. So, and we, we are using AI in order to have real time identification of wildfires so that we can actually help with this uh, other, um, you know, result. And there are many other areas of uh, how to use AI in order to help address the, uh, the what, what is now called adaptation for climate change. Uh, there are also many opportunities for climate change uh, mitigation which is how to use AI in order to try to reduce the amount of carbon emission. And again, I think there are many opportunities here. We are having a few efforts. One that we spoke about recently is about how we're using AI to help um, minimize, uh, to help reduce the amount of carbon emitted in cities by having a better, more optimized uh, traffic light scheduling turns out that this can actually reduce quite a bit the amount of carbon emitted and we can actually do that quite effectively. So again, uh, another example for innovation because the idea for doing that um, it came from one of our engineers uh, over dinner conversation. As a side note, it's not a random innovation that comes out of a random conversation. It's in the context of having the team members all spending days, if not weeks, on coming up with many, many ideas and looking into them and looking for the ones that are going to have the bigger impact. So innovation and how to actually drive for that is, is a whole process that we can discuss also at some point. Um, so anyway, the notion of AI for climate crisis obviously is a big topic and uh, it's one of the areas that captures a lot of my attention these days because obviously it's important for humanity, it's important for all of us. The other field which I'm really passionate about is, uh, is health. Because again, health is one area that we know that AI is going to, is going to make tremendous change. For, and, and all, in many aspects of health, anything from how doctors are, are using information and accessing information to helping out fill gaps with doctors uh, where doctors are uh, not enough specialists out there to helping us, you know, uh, we have our watches, we have our phones, there are sensors, they can actually help us identify many things early on. I'll give one example from a recent visit I was in, uh, in, in, in Thailand just recently, and I was visiting uh, some clinics that are implementing uh, one of the technologies that were actually developed by my team which is a, a technology that uh, helps screen for a condition called diabetic retinopathy, uh, which is a, con this is a condition that is, um, uh, can lead into blindness and uh, people with diabetes actually are at risk to, to get this condition. If not treated, they can be blind, become blind. If treated, it's, uh, it's, it's actually relatively easily treatable. The problem is, of course, identifying it easily, uh, early enough the good news is that it's easy to identify uh, by experts on an image. The bad news is there's a shortage of hundred over 100,000 specialists to actually doing that. And um, in a seminal paper uh, that was published, it was uh, discovered, uh, was identified one of the top uh, papers of the decade by JAMA, which is a leading uh, medical journal. Uh, our team actually showed that you can actually do the identification with AI of this condition quite effectively. And what we, what I was visiting in Thailand is actually a clinic that implemented this AI system where I've seen people coming and two minutes after actually sitting in front of the camera device, they're getting the diagnostics by, by the AI, uh, which tells them whether or not they need to go and get a treatment. It was a better result than they had before. 
before they had to wait for weeks, if not months. And this is an example of how AI can actually help, in this case, sell from blindness. Wow. Just, just about the same time, we announced about, uh, you know, partnership with a few players in the US about using some AI that can help with mammography screening. And that's going to save lives, uh, I anticipate. Now, we're just in the beginning of employing AI for health, I think. We see great momentum. A lot of that is happening in many places. Um, so I, I think this is one of the examples where we're using, going to use technology to enter into so many aspects of the healthcare, um, you know, journey, helping consumers, helping doctors, helping the public health systems. Uh, the opportunities are, are pretty amazing here. That's a. Uh... Incredible. Literally, yes. you know, spending um, your time as a researcher, entrepreneur, leader, um, and um, and world traveler, pretty much. Uh, at this point, going to all these places and making a positive impact, you know, uh, and, and having a really monumental uh, effect there. And so I, I can't think of many things more, more impactful than that. And I know firsthand how how proud you are of, of these accomplishments and how everybody around who's observing them is, is so, um, you know, mind blown about, you know, how, the, this, the ways in which you use these technologies to literally change people's lives in some cases, save their lives. And in some cases, just augment them in really meaningful ways from the way that you allow them to, to use their, to continue using their senses like eyesight. Uh, to being able to communicate or being able to have better human phone computer interaction, right? It's uh, that whole range that, that you touch on, which is pretty amazing. And, you know, I started this show uh, three years ago, really with the goal of learning and with the goal of uh, getting to know, you know stories uh, that will inspire me to, to be my best self and my most fulfilled self in terms of what problems I want to solve and tackle and the type of leader that I want to be. And, and so first I want to thank you for serving as a, as a key inspiration along with, with mom and, and all at Leon and, uh, and everybody else around me. Um, and, uh, I, I want to end with, with one question, which is, uh, not a trivial one, but it's a, uh, but it's an interesting one nevertheless. And so if you had to conceive of the, uh, and distill for a piece, for a single piece of advice that that you would give me at this point uh, from you know looking back and this last hour of of our conversation and your journey you know what would be a key piece of advice to give um me right now well let me start saying that uh, first that um talking about inspiration first i'm inspired by so many people around me let me start with the with 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 mom shavit and with uh, Leanne or yourself, uh, my kids, that I, I'm really proud of your accomplishments. And, uh, and every person going after their passion and doing uh, such an amazing journey in that. Uh, also by my team. So, you know, we didn't discuss much uh, about the site in Israel that um, I was fortunate to start uh, some 16 years ago. And um, I'm pretty amazed of the development and uh, and the accomplishments of uh, of everybody there and what they were doing there. I just want to acknowledge that we had an hour of dense material and still we somehow glossed over you starting Sorry. Google site in Israel, which today is more than 2000 engineers, but we'll leave that for another episode. Totally. Uh, and I want first to refer back to to this occasion, which, and again, thanks for inviting me for this thousand episode. I remember you used when you told me about starting this kind of stuff. Actually, before, I remember when you were telling me about your habit to meet an interesting person every day and, um, and learn from them and leverage the fact that you were uh, in the Stanford campus uh, with so many interesting people around you and uh, how you pivoted in COVID to actually doing it in, uh, <clears throat> over video conference and uh, then took this extra step to convert it into... 20 minutes later, which was an amazing, uh, wonderful example of actually taking a crisis and making, um, getting the best out of it. 
and um, and 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 kudos for that. And I know how popular your your kind of uh, program is. So having a thousand people kind of um, uh, telling their stories so that uh, so many people can actually listen to them and learn from them, I think is is quite inspiring on its own. So uh, really congratulations on this uh, accomplishment. And I love the curiosity you're following and uh, the fact that this is actually the driver for doing this kind of program as many so many other things you're doing. What advice can I give? Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I guess we have many similarities, one of which is that we have all these vast interests and we try to do everything at the same time. So don't stop doing more than one thing at a time because that's what gets you energized. But at any given time, we do need to make our selections of where to focus more and where to less, when to put things on pause and when to actually double up. It's essentially a very subtle priority exercise, especially for those who are interested in more than one thing. So it's a judgment call of how to and when to focus and uh, how to do it properly. That's true, I guess, for every... It's almost the same advice I would give every to every team leader, you know, or every startup. So, you know, there are startups in the early days, uh, the cliche says you cannot be too focused. Well, take it seriously. Um, at some point you say we want to invest in the future and you do, you want to take some of the risks. It's a, it's all the time making those judgment and adapting them to the situation, to the circumstances. Same with life. There are certain times that you are working around the clock. It's not sustainable for forever. Um, so there are times that that's what we do. We do all these all-nighters, but we know this is not the, the right pace for long term. Sometimes it's Brilliant. necessary. And then, of course, we want to find the right cadence. Um, I think having fun along the journey is always important. It doesn't mean having fun every day. I mean, part of work is also to deal with less fun things uh, in order to do the to get the things that we'd like to do. So, uh, but uh, there's this notion of following your passion, which I think is true in the right framing. It's not on the every day and it's about taking into consideration everything around us. And, um, and life is not linear. So everything that we do is a learning experience for something else. If you'd asked me, if, you know, many years ago, what I'm, if I'm going to be doing what I do today, I wouldn't anticipate it. I wouldn't necessarily expect that if many years ago I had to choose between doing research versus doing product development, that it will be time actually that my day-to-day -day job is actually to do both deep research on some of the most uh, important problems. And at the same time, this leads to actual product development that actually touches people's life. So, you know, these are things that I could not anticipate. So life is full of surprises. Not all of them are great. Many of them are amazing. Dad, Yossi Matias, thank you so much. Yes, it was Michael, my son. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.